Today is Sunday, and it's not just any Sunday, it's the Sunday for which my wife and I have plans. You see, when I get home from church and she gets home from church and we have leftovers for lunch, we're going to get in the car and we're going to drive across town to the community garden where Kimberly has a variety of plants growing. And you know what we're going to do? Pull weeds. Pull weeds. <laughs> Now, I've got to tell you, Kimberly is a master gardener. You know, she went through the whole Yukon certification program. She can garden circles around most people. And so when we get there, the first question out of my mouth is going to be something along the lines of, can I pull this one, or is that a plant you're trying to grow? <coughs> and she will be patient with me because she's a good and kind woman who understands that her husband is a moron, <laughs> at least when it comes to gardening. We all have our unique skill sets. But for me, you know, I, I know what a tomato plant looks like. But, you know, when things are first starting up, I need guidance. Well, that was the case in the parable that Jesus told as well. Only it was a little tougher from telling the difference between a tomato and a blade of invasive crabgrass because the tares, as the King James Bible renders it, the weeds that we read about in today's new Revised Standard Version, were actually near identical to the wheat plant. The plant, by the way, is called bearded darnel, and it looks exactly like wheat, at least until you reach the point where the, the seeds set. And then you can kind of tell a little bit of difference. They're smaller than grains of wheat. Now the problem, of course, with the bearded darnel and the wheat growing together, as any Middle Eastern farmer will tell you, is that the roots interlock. So literally, when you pull one, you pull the other. So this farmer that Jesus spoke of in his parable was faced indeed with a problem. What do you do when the spirit of Darnell starts to crop up among the, the wheat? Now, you might say, you know, you can sort it out at the end, and you would be right. There are ways. You can take the wheat and you can, as you thresh it, throw it up into the air. The Darnell seeds, being smaller, will blow away with the chaff, most of them. You can sift it, and being smaller, you can have those drop through the grate near sieve. But if it doesn't, there's a problem. The darnel plant is poisonous. It'll induce very interesting hallucinations. And with enough, it will indeed bring death. So it's a serious problem that the farmer in Jesus' story was facing. How do you handle this? What's the best way? Now, of course, these days, our modern farmers would probably go and spray all kinds of crazy pesticides that would kill everything other than the genetically modified crops that they're growing. That's a different sermon. Probably ought to be this sermon, but it's a different one. But in Jesus' day, the only options were mechanical. And for the farmer in Jesus' parable, his commitment to growing that wheat, to having a viable crop, was high enough that he was willing to take those extra steps at the end, rather than going out and trying to uproot the weeds. We, however, tend to want to pull weeds. Well, my wife does. I'd be just as happy to let them grow. That won't be my lot today, though. We want to pull those weeds. We want to make sure that the plants that we're growing get all the water that comes going to them, that they get all the nutrients from the soil, that nothing is choked out, as we heard about from last week's parable. But you know, we do that with people, too, when we start branding some as wheat 
and summer's weeds. Way back in the year 385, a group of bishops condemned Priscillian of Avila for heresy, and he and six of his followers were beheaded. They were the first Christians to be killed by other Christians for their religious views. And historians estimate that in the next two and a half centuries, that's two and a half centuries, not two and a half millennia, Christian imperial authorities slaughtered 25,000 more people for their lack of creedal correctness. And we haven't even gotten to the Spanish Inquisition yet. It's easy for us to look back at history and see those times when people have run amok, using their faith <coughs> as an excuse for violence. Now, we congregationalists aren't exactly uh, clean-handed on the matter. And if we spend too much time pointing at our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, we are ignoring our own history. After all, it was our Congregationalist ancestors who came here seeking religious freedom and promptly denied it to everyone else, going so far as to banish Roger Williams from the Massachusetts colony so that he had to go and found Rhode Island, sending Ann Hutchison with him as well. And it was our Congregationalist ancestors who used to hang and burn Quakers on Boston Commons. And we can't forget what happened in Salem, can we? Those uppity women who got called witches. One of the judges at the Salem trials was a man named Samuel Sewell. Sewell, the Congregationalist minister. Well, he was never quite convinced that the women were guilty. And he felt remorse. And so in 1697, five years after the witch trials, he walked into a Boston church and he offered a public apology. The only one of the three judges to ever do so. And as a result, he was shunned. He was rebuffed by a social circle. And in later years, Sewell went on to write The Selling of Joseph, one of the first books opposing the colonists' treatment of Indians and African slaves. Sewell, despite his complicity early on, had seen what that violence, the willingness to use violence, could bring about. And he changed his life working for peace and justice instead. You know, so often we find ourselves pointing to those gross miscarriages of justice, where some people are labeled as good and others as bad. We see it cropping up later in our own history. During the McCarthy era, with the House on American Activities Committee that went on its own witch hunt, looking to pull the weeds from our society. In my own history, I watched as the Southern Baptist Convention went through the same thing, with people who weren't fundamentalists being told, there's no place for you here. You are a weed and you are being pulled. We do it over and over as humans. But you know, we always make a mistake when we start to label ourselves as wheat and someone else as weeds. We pass judgment upon the innocent. And in our rush to defend what we believe to be right, we soon find ourselves on the wrong side of history. Even when we do see behaviors that we could honestly call weedy, we end up destroying other people in our efforts to combat those that we believe to be wrong. You know, our task isn't to go rooting out weeds. 
Our task is to be wheat. And to be the best wheat that we can. The mystery of Jesus' parable has a lot to do with God's timing. That and our own inability to judge. Because we always make mistakes when we trust our judgment over God's. God has this knack for being able to show us things that we ourselves can never see. There's always evil. There's always wrongdoing, and we always feel that it's our job to fix it. But Barbara Brown Taylor, in her book, Bread of Angels, says that what the boss in the parable seems to know is that the best and the only real solution to evil is to bear good fruit. Our job, she says, in a mixed field is not to give ourselves to the enemy by devoting all of our energy to the destruction of weeds, but to mind our own business, so to speak. Our business being the reconciliation of the world through the practice of unshielded love if we will give ourselves to that, God will take care of the rest. I think Barbara Brown Taylor hits the nail on the head when we look at the world as being a field. But maybe, just maybe, there's another way to think about the parable that Jesus told. After all, scholars tell us that Jesus probably didn't go around telling a parable and then explaining it. And that's sort of like telling a joke and then explaining it. The joke should really stand for itself. The parable should really stand for itself. And allow people to think on it, to ponder, to mull over what the meaning or meanings might be. So maybe, just maybe, if we let ourselves hear Jesus' parable a little bit differently, we can find another understanding. Perhaps instead of being wheat or weeds, instead of being good plants or bad ones, maybe we're the field. The field of good and bad growing within us. Psalm 139, that I sang to you early, reminds us that God knows what's inside of us, our thoughts and our feelings. It tells us that God knows us completely, the good and the bad, those thoughts of our minds, those desires of our hearts. God knows those parts of our personalities that cause us problems and the parts that help us to stand up to the problems that come our way. So often, we try and correct ourselves, trying to change who we are, to be who we think we should become. And it's well intentioned. We hope we're, <clears throat> hope we're doing the right things. But sometimes those prickly parts of us those little bits of our personality that make us a little hard to get along with sometimes are the exact same parts that when push comes to shove in the world help us to stand up for what's right, aren't they? So often we as Christians have been taught that being nice is virtue. And we get awfully good at it. We get good at letting people do whatever they want around us. But sometimes we need to push back just a little bit. We need to get in touch with that part that if we were pulling weeds, we might have gotten rid of earlier. We need to realize that all of who we are is a gift from God. We need to realize that, yes, there are parts of us that probably shouldn't be the most expressed parts. But maybe even those on some great day will be tools that God can use to remake the world for good.
So before you start pulling your weeds, and I know this sounds like license to hang on to all of your bad habits, I do not intend that. But before you start pulling weeds too hard, before you start trying to make yourself into, you know, Mr. or Miss Nice Christian, realize that God sometimes needs that tough and weedy part of you. That it's not a weed at all. That it's a shoot of wheat that is just beginning to take hold. And those parts of you that are indeed weeds, God will take care of that too. All in time. If we open ourselves to the care of that heavenly gardener. Let us then tend our own fields. Let us do our best to live as wheat in the world. Let us open ourselves to God's care. And in all of that, may we be blessed.